Coming back to our next guest, which was a mystery for me um, until I met him five minutes ago. I Googled him uh, a couple of days ago, and the first name on, on the Google search was of uh, a veteran American actor. So I was quite very excited. I was like, wow, amazing. And then I saw that he died in 1973. So there was no, uh, so that I haven't discovered him. And then the second one on the list was Ron Victor, in, again in America. So I wasn't sure about why we're inviting him, but then I saw he also died a couple of years ago. But then I met him two, literally 10 minutes ago, and I'm happy to say he's alive and with us today, and uh, he is um, a, a foreign direct investment consultant with, uh, told me not to say EY, but that's the one way I remember. <laughs> Please welcome Michael Dunn. Can you hear me okay? Good. Uh, good evening, everybody. I'm glad I'm alive too. Uh, my name's Mike Dunn. Um, I work for the Department for International Trade on the Inward Investment Team. And the reason why we've got the EY branding is because the government outsources the UK Inward Investment Function to the private sector. And EY has been providing that service for the last two years and has just been awarded a new contract to run it for at least another three years. So uh, my business card says DIT, but I'm actually employed by EY, so I hope that makes sense. So uh, this is a whistle-stop tour of UK foreign direct investment. The UK government uh, employed about 1,400 people worldwide to provide trade support, which is export from the UK, and inward investment support. The biggest partner in that relationship is, is trade by far. But obviously, inward investment is extremely important. There is a wealth of evidence around the benefits that inward <coughs> investment brings in terms of jobs, uh, and obviously that, that gives the, the government taxes, which the government like. But what everybody forgets about inward investment is the impact on the strategic supply chain, because if a, a successful company comes here bringing new ideas and skilled labor, then it moves the supply chain forward, and this is often overlooked. People, it's very easy to focus on jobs and taxes, that's great, but it's the impact on the supply chain as well. So I work in, in, in a sector team, we're, we're based around sector teams, we provide support throughout the UK, and we interact with uh, devolved assemblies, uh, Northern Ireland, Scotland, Wales, and also local partners. Now, just, just to qualify things, we provide free support, we will never charge a foreign company coming to the UK for anything we do. And because it's free, that, that means there are limits on what we can do. So uh, to manage expectations, um, we don't have any money to give away, fortunately. Um, we can't do primary research for you, and we can't do uh, business development in the sense of giving us names and telephone numbers. So to counter that, to give you the good news, the UK government seeks to foster the best, related, the best environment in Europe for a company to set up. And I think we've reached that because uh, generally the UK doesn't perform very well in terms of foreign direct investment projects. In fact, if I just refer to my notes for a second, excuse me. Um, so last year, for 2017-18, there were 2,072 recorded projects for foreign companies in the UK, where a project is a new company coming to the UK and employing at least one person or a company which is here expanding and recruiting more people. About 120 of those came from India. So, so that's, that, that's how important the future is. Um, the main countries, obviously, the US, India, um, France, Germany, and obviously China and Australia and New Zealand. But it does vary a little bit by sector. So, how does the UK government make the UK attractive? Foreign First of all, it's very easy to set up a business here. It's quick, it's easy, and cheap. There are no restrictions on owning property. Um, we encourage investment. People like me are here to give foreign companies coming to the UK and open the door to push out. We, we are here to accelerate their landing in the UK. Um, it's easy to finance businesses, there's a variety of different finance sources. If a company has a viable business model, we have an attractive proposition, it will find finance. We have provided, but we can provide information to 
companies about when they can see that. We're in a very competitive corporate tax rate. Um, it was 28% some years ago. It's currently 19% coming down to 17% in 2020. So again, this is all vast made in the UK, very attractive place to be. Um, what else? Uh, the strategic location of the UK. Um, culturally, um, we, we have a lot in common with countries like India, and Commonwealth countries, language, law, time zones, we sit midway between North America and the Far East. And we also have uh, a very educated and skilled workforce. What else do we do? Um, a lot of, lot of R&D and tax support for in innovation. And we have a, an advanced digital and transport infrastructure. Not perfect, but perfectly advanced. So, um, just to put things into context, in, in, in India, there are at least eight DIT offices. So the way things work is that uh, if a company is interested in coming to the UK, uh, a project will be allocated to somebody like me or one of my colleagues. I'm part of a team of 100 people in the UK, and we then provide project management support. So we will, we will provide information to speed up the, the process of that company sort of things we do typically, it could be an initial market overview, we, we have access to secondary data purchased, um, we have information on networking, where we want to go, we can do benchmark comparisons, not only between country, so locations in the UK, we have information on skills, a lot of this is publicly available and people can do it themselves, but we, we're doing it all the time, so we can probably do it a bit quicker instead of doing it at a time. So for example, an Indian company I was working with was seeking a particular set of maths graduates. So we provided them with information about which universities were actually running the suitable courses and where they should go and into the people on the graduate program. Um, I'll mention Brexit briefly because it's been touched on. Um, in 1980, there were nine countries in the European community, and they accounted for something like 30% of the global GDP. There are 28 countries in the EU, which now account for 17% of GDP. And when the UK leaves, 27 countries will account for 15% of GDP. So that gives you some context of, of the diminishing role of Europe in the growing world. 90% of growth in the coming decades is brought down to the So, uh, it's a huge very quick run through. Are there any quick queries I can deal with? I'll take now. Um, just one thing. We, um, we seem to have uh, quite stringent money uh, money laundering regs implemented by the FCA. Yes. And, and this causes um, considerable problems uh, for foreign directors, foreign ownership, and, and things like that. Some of our banking clearances can take up to six months. So how is how are you guys addressing uh, this to speed up that? end-to-end okay. -end process okay. because it, it's overzealous regulation in some instances uh, by uh, you know conservative compliance offices you know sure yeah sure. okay um, I think I know where you're coming from yeah so 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 basically um, the banks have suffered terrible penalties because of uh, non-compliance with money laundering mm. so uh, the banks are now very strict about money laundering and they have so we deal with new companies coming here and they're trying to get bank accounts. And the banks have to comply with something called KYC, yep. know your customer. Yep. So they have to understand uh, basically who owns the company and where is any funding coming from. Mm -hmm. And that is very costly for them to do. And so they look at the business model of the company and take a decision about whether or not they're actually interested in your business. Well, well, this is right, we get rejections half three quarters of the way through a KYC process. And, and, and you know, it's yeah. a waste of time. Yeah. Yeah. It, is, it, is, it is a challenge, um, but ultimately it's in everybody's interest because it's, it's down to, to stop money laundering. Mm. The sort of things that we do, um, as, as well as myself, there are a number of colleagues who work with me that are specialists. For example, we have a bean specialist, a sweet specialist. We also have a banking specialist. And they can, they can advise on which banks might be the best ones to approach based on companies' activities yeah. like turnover and
Um, but clearly, what the banks are looking at is, is what type of business are they in? If it's, if it's, if it's monetary business, blockchain, and if it's coming from Syria yeah, or yeah, Russia, yeah, yeah, yeah. just forget it. Honestly, yeah. it really is going to be very difficult. Um, but that's, you know, it's, it's all about pushing you in the right direction. Is that yeah. yeah, no, that, that's good. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll be in touch. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So, so I, I understand, I think you help uh, companies expand in the UK, yes. but do you also support them with uh, any sort of visa support as well, if any founding members are okay, coming? Okay, so the sort of thing we do, we have a wealth of preferred information, for example, how to start a company, how to have a bank account, uh, visa information. Yeah. So we provide preliminary information, which is all in the public domain, but it's, we, we collate it together to make sure. life easier. Um, the actual visa application will be supported by the local consulate of the bit of government, for example, in India. Does that help? Yeah. Now uh, you sort of put a lot of emphasis on foreign direct investments in terms of any Indian, I'll take like India as an example, Indian organization or startups to start in the UK. Does that work vice versa as well under your regime or? Um, it, it typically hasn't. The UK government has not promoted UK companies setting up overseas, but that is changing. And also, um, the trade function helps companies export, but that is that that function about helping them to set up overseas. So, so what about if a com company is like the parent company is the UK company and you want to open the subsidiaries in other countries? Yes. Would that be part of the regime? Uh, in the first instance, we'd be looking to help them trade internationally. And, and I would say the, the actual um, setting up company so to speak. Yeah. For example, should the government help Jaguar open the factory in Czechoslovakia? Yeah. Right. Take it all away from Britain. A sensitive issue. But any 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 company that comes to the UK is eligible for the BIT trade support. So so once once we're here and you're looking to export, we can have the trade internationally in. Any more for anyone? Is there a certain amount of money somebody has to bring in to get your, your support? No, not at all. Basically, um, if an inquiry is made and the project is triaged, so um, as long as it's a plan to actually open a business here, establish a business, have a place of operation, and recruit at least one person, of course, like this. And an awful lot of companies coming in are very small. You know, the, the average size of a company coming in is probably one and a half people initially and then they grow, and they might start off in a place like this, preferred working space, over time, um, that's economical for perhaps 10 or 12 people, and then they start spinning out. So about a third of those 2,000 projects I mentioned initially come to London, but I can also tell you within 12 months, 20% of that one third have spun out because it's cheaper. So this, this an awful lot of companies have come to London because of the, the infrastructure, the access here, the, the ecosystem, but we can tell you where else in the UK you can get good hours or similar or good enough based on the drivers and where it might be cheaper as well. So for example, I, I worked in a project, somebody wanted to come to London and they were interested in going somewhere nearby London and uh, we looked at uh, somewhere not too far away and it was 50% of the cost based on property cost and salary. And it's only 40 minutes away on the train. That, that sort of information. Are we done? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.